Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, chapter 24, Genesis, in the beginning. And we have come to this place where Sarah has passed away. Abraham, with, with a guaranteed title to a strip of land in Hebron, uh, established a sepulchre. Uh, for to bury the dead, and so it was. But here he is, and Isaac's a young man now growing up. It's time for him to have a wife. And Abraham's going to see to that because he's in a strange land, and he doesn't want to take a wife among these strangers because the Nephilim had intermixed with the Canaanites at this time in part, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and uh, he didn't naturally... Inasmuch as it was through Isaac that the seed would be called, that means that Christ would come, is what it means, then she had to be of um, that family, that is to say the wife that he would choose. So there's where we pick it up at, uh, Genesis chapter 24, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And Abraham was old. And well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things, and he certainly had. Here at a hundred years old, he gave him a child. Verse 2, And Abraham said unto his eldest uh, servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. This was a custom of swearing uh, by the family that, I mean, it was irrevocable. It was a, and this particular servant, of course, would be Eleazar, as we learned back in chapter 15, verse 2, when he didn't even have a son. He said, is Eleazar going to be able to inherit everything I have? You know, and, and God, of course, gave him that son. So uh, it is not written that this was Eleazar, but no doubt that it is. Um, so verse 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Uh, just won't put up with it. Inasmuch again, as I stated, the Nephilim had intermixed with the, uh, with, with the various people, the Hittites and the Canaanites and... and, and uh, other people that were there, and it would destroy, it would, it would give Satan the great success that Satan had tried to do in bringing about the flood, and even in Eve's downfall in the beginning with Cain, bringing Cain into the world. No, no way is he going to go through that. Verse 4, but thou shalt go unto my country, and to my kindred, kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. You're going to do that. Verse 5, And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? Remember God's promise, 6, And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again under what this is saying, under no circumstances will you take my son to that country. Verse 7, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. I know that this is God's promise. I know God is in it. It's what Abraham is saying, and Abraham had the faith to believe that, that 
the angel of the Lord is going to arrange this where it will come off without a hitch. Now, that's real faith. Abraham, no doubt, had done much praying and seeking and talking to the Father about this. And, and in sending Eleazar, uh, he had little doubt of what God would go before him and um, probably was already giving thanks. Verse 8, And if the woman will not uh, be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear of this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. In other words, if, if the woman refuses, after you have chosen the correct one, then uh, from placing your hand on my thigh, then that oath is broken and you don't have to worry about it. You're free and clear. Verse 9, And the servant put his hand into the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. It will be so. Uh, this was a contract that was just irreversible uh, without, unless, unless it met the, the content of the contract. Verse 10, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And uh, so it was. Here was Abraham's kindred. He went back to the land where we would find Ur in the very beginning. And of course, in the in a chapter before, we learned that that uh, there were twelve of Abraham's brothers' children there. That and uh, that to to choose from, verse eleven, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. In other words, he's not ta this, this servant's not taking any chances. He's kneeling down. Before he goes, he's going to talk to the Father. Now listen carefully. And he said, verse 12, And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. I want you to hear his prayer. Verse 13, Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city uh, come out to draw water. They're going to be coming right here. 14, And let it come to pass, let it happen this way, that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my, thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And you know, that's quite a lot to ask of our father. I mean, not only that He's going to be here waiting. He's not going to go looking for her. He's going to wait right there, and when the one comes that it should be that's chosen by Almighty God, he will ask this question, and she will give a specific answer. Now, that's asking a lot, but that's what he has. That's kind of the wish he has placed before Almighty God to have this come to pass to show a kindness that he would know the oath he had already given to Abraham would be fulfilled in this one. He would be on the right track. Do you, do you know how he can be so sure? He keeps God in the equation. Okay. Do you ever do that when you have to make rough decisions? Do you just make your own mind up? Do you just go about your way, or do you, do you ask him? Do you talk to him? Do you trust him? Do you have faith in him? Think about it. And this, this is why that he was blessed and always blessed. This is why Abraham, of all the people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, in the great faith chapter, that we see his name outstanding by the faith he had in the living God. And here even his faithful servant 
showing forth that training, that practice. Verse 15 to continue. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebecca came out who was born to Bethuel, that's to say the dweller in El, in God, the son of Milcah, the queen, the wife of Nahor, and Nahor meaning snorting, he's quite a hoss, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher up on her shoulder. So here, here we have a granddaughter of Nahor. Okay? Not a daughter, but we have a granddaughter. And don't forget what Rebecca means. It means captivating or the ensnare. Her very presence would, it's no wonder they named her this. Because her very presence brought it forth. She would ensnare your heart. Verse 16, and the damsel was very fair to look upon. She was beautiful, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. 17, and the servant ran to meet her. Old Eleazar runs down the path, meets her, and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. 18, and she said, drink, my Lord, and she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. Now, let's see if she completes the, the uh, request of God, verse 19, and when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. She, she was, I mean, right there, I mean, this certified it. By the hand of God, this is the one. This girl, this ensnarer, this captivator, has captivated even old Eleazar into knowing, boy, God has really blessed us and how quick it is before I even finished asking. Here she was. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it was. Let's go with the next verse, please, 20. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. She didn't just mosey down there. She didn't just lazily draw water. She ran. She was vivacious. She was getting it done. Can-do type person. That's who God always chooses. Somebody that produces fruit. Can-do. That's a servant of God. But here she is, and why would she ensnare? Why would she not? You know, uh, giving, drawing water in a pitcher for 10 camels, the way they can put water away, she made a lot of trips, and she ran all the way. Verse 21, and the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. It would seem definitely so. 22, and it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring and of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. Uh, hey, that's pretty nice uh, 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 merchandise. I mean, that's... We're, we're right down near where it's at. That's, that's real nice stuff. Verse 23, and he said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? Is there any way you can put us up for the night? Verse 24, and she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, uh, which she bare unto Nahor. Uh, in other words, she's a granddaughter of Nahor, Abraham's brother. And here, this old servant has to know, boy, we've, we've hit pay dirt. This is, this is the one. 20, uh, because she meets the, quali the, the qualifications as being family. 25. She said, moreover unto him, 
we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. We can feed two camels. We got a guest room and plenty of food. You come on down. Again, the ensnare. Verse 26, and the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Now, now don't forget that. You know, a lot of people, when God answers prayer and gives them the approval and everything is okay, they go on their merry way enjoying the, the, the um, victory. Always take a moment and thank God for success. Always, don't, don't forget him. He appreciates that. It makes his day. And people that will do that, he can use because he knows they appreciate him. You know, when, when you do something that is a good service to someone and they really take time and moment and thank you for it, don't, don't you appreciate that? Of course you do. Well, so does God. So does our Heavenly Father. So let that, let that sink into your mind. It always pays dividends to thank our Father. Always bring him into the equation of your daily life and thank him of, of, of success. Don't forget him then. You know, I, I'm going to tell you what happens, and maybe maybe somebody needs this. If, if you get carried away and overjoyed with the blessings of God and forget to thank him, that's a sign to Satan, boy, this is easy pickings. While he's all happy and up, I can start sawing the floor right out from under him. And Satan will try that. You can, you can rest assured. So always thank the Father, and that makes Satan run. Okay, and continuing on then, next verse, 27, and it reads, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I bring, I being in the way, the Lord led, led me to the house of my master's brother and brought me right to the door, met the girl. Fantastic. And he's thanking the father. 28. And the damsel ran. Now, don't, don't overlook the, the, the verb here. She, what, she ran. So, so vivacious, so anxious, and told them of her mother's house these things. That messenger of the great news uh, she runs and tells and and probably even shows the bracelets and the things that she had been given and and it was good news here from a, a, a long lost uh, relative uh, verse 29 and rebecca had a brother uh-oh and his name was laban that laban in the hebrew tongue means white okay like the cedars of lebanon means of, of whiteness and Laban ran out unto the man into the well. Let's, let's look over these pretty gifts. He had seen them, and he had an eye for that sort of thing. Laban did. And I'm, I'm not running him down or anything. It's just nature. Verse 30, And it came to pass, when he saw the earring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that uh, he came un that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. In other words, this this grabbed his interest. And here uh, we got somebody that's pretty pretty well um, healed here. Thirty one, and he said, "Come in, thou blessed of the Lord." Uh, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and the room for the camels. It's, it's all set for you. You come on in. And he might have thought, maybe you've got some more bracelets and things here in, in your pocket. 32. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. I mean, taking good care of them here. Verse 33, And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told mine Aaron. And he said, Speak on. 
Now let us know what your, what your uh, Aaron is, 34. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And naturally they knew who Abraham was. That's, that was their uncle <laughs> and great uncle. 35, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. And he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. Uh, he's a rich man. 36. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. I mean, Isaac owns it all. He inherits every bit of it. Isaac is a very rich man. 37, and my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. You just won't do it. It won't work. It won't have it. 38, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. This is what my mission is, is what he's telling him. 39, and I said unto my master, peradventure the woman will not follow me. 40, and he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. The angel of the Lord is going to guide you right on in there. And it's obvious he had. 41. Then shalt thou be clear from this thy oath when thou comest to my kindred. And if thou give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. If, if they do not give you a wife for my son, then just forget it. That'll be okay. You're, you're out from under the oath. 42, and I came this day unto the well and, and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way, which I go, 43, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and, and um, I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. 44. And she shall say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. Let, God picked her, in other words. 45. And behold, I had done speaking in mine heart, before rather, before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca, the ensnarer, came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down into the well and drew water, and I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. 46, And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. In other words, God picked this girl. It, it, it would be obvious to a believer, one that knew. Verse 47, And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah the queen bare unto him, and I, her name means queen, not that she was a queen, and I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets on her hands. It was obvious this was the one. Verse 48, And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had let me, led me in the right way to take his, my master's brother's daughter unto his son. Now, again, this is something you want to always remember. Share the fact he thanked the father for this having come to pass, that this vivacious little maiden 
drew water for ten camels. And, and he himself, just as the angel of the Lord had said, or he had, he had uh, asked, 49, and now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. I want to know what my next move will be. Do, do I, are, are you going to let Rebecca go with me, or is it all over? My next move is, is I'm released. 50, and then Laban and Bethelial uh, answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto the bad or good. In other words, what can we say? It's obvious Almighty God has chosen uh, uh, our sister and our daughter. What good would it do for we, mere mortals, to say anything one way or the other? God picked her. And this shows faith on their part, even. 51, Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And um, they haven't quite asked the girl yet. 52, And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard these words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Again, giving thanks, always. 53, And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And, and, and uh, so it was. 54, And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. Uh, it's time for me to go. 55. And, and her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. Um, now, inasmuch as God has done the choosing, inasmuch as God has let us know it's the right thing and that's what he wants, you kind of don't want to let man get in the way of God's work. You want me to say that again? It was obvious beyond a doubt that it was God's will that she go. And never, never, I, I, and it's understandable that the mother would, I mean, this, was, this daughter was something else. She was the ensnarer. And no doubt her mother loved her uh, and, and cared for her, and it's just natural she would want to hang on to her just a little bit longer to get the goodbyes and everything said. But again, don't leave God out of the equation. God had done the choosing. Verse 56, to continue. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. Don't get in God's way. It's obvious he has chosen. 58 and 50, which next verse, please? 57. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Let's, let's, let's ask her. 58, and they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. You know, it's about time they got around to asking her, but uh, the gifts are given, and Rebekah's, uh, as always, she's vivacious, she's the ensnare, um, she's ready to go. Verse 59, and they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. Quite a troop, and they're on the march. Verse 60, And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate thee. 
And, and how, how would they know? Because that's exactly what would transpire. Because through this damsel would come the very seed of Isaac's that in which the seed was called that would bring forth the Christ child and that Christ child bringing salvation to the world whereby it was a blessing to the whole world. Millions, billions that would see him, know him, and accept him in the wonderful things. Uh, verse 61, And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And, and so it was. Uh, there, again, the caravan is marching. 62. And Isaac came from the way of the well, Laharor. Let, let me say that in the Hebrew, Laharai, uh, which it means the well of, uh, uh, of the, um, the well of the living God. And, and so it is, uh, verse 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening tide, and he lifted up his eyes, and he saw, and behold, the camels were coming. 64. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. I must have been impressed. I mean, she was as vivacious as she was in all things, and six, 65, and for she had said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, it is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself, doing this and as the custom. 66, and the servant told Isaac all things that he had done, the success of the trip. 67, to complete the chapter, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This was the ensnare. This is the one that took his heart, that repaired it, that comforted him, and would be the mother of those that would come. For in Isaac, as it is written, the seed would be called. For in Isaac would come that strain, not, not taking a wife of the Canaanites, the Hittites, or the Perizzites, which might have Nephilim mixed within them, which would have made void and wiped out all the action of the flood and God's work, but has this pure virgin of the stock of Abraham, through which Mother Eve, the mother of all living, being Christ coming from her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, to bring eternal life. That's what was the only living there is, eternal life to all people whomsoever will. So there we have the beautiful story of the ensnare, Rebecca and Isaac. Uh, don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico. 
throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it, won't you? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. Our Father is the judge. You have the right to discern who you should fellowship with, who you should study with, and so forth. That is a gift from God. Always honor that. Honor your Father and thank Him for that precious gift. Those of you that listen by shortwave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer. At the end of the hour, we'll give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address, why? God knows what you're thinking. You're his child. He created your soul. He owns your soul. So many people think, well, I'm gonna give my soul to God someday. No, too late, Charlie. He's already got it. All souls belong to God, Ezekiel 18.4. So it, that's not your prerogative. He's got it, and he's going to do with it what you deserve. You're going to get everything you've got coming to you. So whatever you do, that's up to you. Everyone totally makes up the very thing that the judgment will be because it's always fair and equitable. So that's, that's it. That's the way she goes. And um, But our Father does love you. You let him know that you love him in return. Won't you do that? Let him know you love him. Why? That's what he wants from you. Don't let that pass. Bring God into all equations of your life. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you need. Guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we got um, Roy and Amber from California. And uh, thank you for your comments. I have one question for you. Is it understanding, is it my understanding correct that in the last days the wound to the head will be delivered by God's elect upon the one world political system? With the aid of the Holy Spirit, you got it. Right on course. Um, Maury from, uh, from Maine. Um, and uh, thank you for your comments. My question is, how can we recognize the true Christ from the false one? Please tell us so we won't be misguided. I think it's a risk to our spirit and soul if we don't know which and who is the true one. It, it's real easy to tell. As long as you're in a flesh body, whoever claims to be Christ is a fake. Because at the, he comes at the, the false one comes at the sixth trump, and you'll still be in a flesh body. But the true Christ doesn't come until the seventh. And instantly when that happens, you're changed into a spiritual body. But that in itself gives you your answer. False Christ comes at the sixth trump. True Christ doesn't come until the seventh. You can't confuse them because the first, this is why Christ, you, you might read Mark chapter 13 over again. If they say if he's in the desert or somewhere else, don't go. As long as you're in the flesh body, don't you dare go because he's a fake. For the false Christ shall come first, always first. Want to check out, see how many people have really studied the Word of God. Uh, Michael from Oklahoma. The other day you were talking about the flyaway doctrine and you quoted Mark 13. I would not... I could not find it in that chapter in Mark 13. Could you please give me um, assistance in what chapter and verse? Well, probably I said you should go to Ezekiel chapter 13, and there's where it says God would speak to those daughters that sewed pillows, which means coverings over every knuckle and joint in his outreach saving arms to the people and cover it up with flyaway doctrine. In other words, God said, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. And he is. Why? Because they're trying to work out their own salvation when God has made it very clear. He's got work for us to do in Mark 13. And that's why you confused with Mark 13. That's the work we do. We're delivered up before the false Christ, and the Holy Spirit speaks through us, and that brings about that wound. Raymond from uh, West Virginia, I hope you can answer my question on TV. We're going to do it right now if we can. 
can Satan put thoughts in your mind? Only if you allow it. So you, if you are given power, as it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, you're given power over all your enemies. Uh, and Satan is your enemy. But he can't touch you. He's afraid of you as long as you utilize that power. And, and, and naturally that power comes when you use the name of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name, go. Get out of my life. Don't, don't ever let any, anyone put any evil thoughts in your mind. Think positive and cast that that is negative out the back door. Make it a, give it a little cemetery out in the backyard. Anytime a negative thought comes along, get rid of it and bring in the thoughts of Christ. Uh, Paul from Illinois, I have a question for my good teacher. Well, thank you. Is in, in my Strong's number 7014, after the description of Quayan, that's Cain in the English, the end has Cain, Kenites, and Perin dash S. I cannot find this symbol dash S under the special symbols page. Would you teach me this symbol? Well, it's, it simply means after the semicolon or the colon, it gives you the words that Cain is translated into. And what it's telling you is that it is translated as the word K-E-N-I-T-E, -E, singular, but also letting you know in Perrin that oftentimes, sometimes it is translated Kenites, meaning plural, with an S on it. So, quite simple, no problem, you got it. Uh, Nancy from, Nancy is from Arizona. Question, ceremonial law, the church, civil law, and the Ten Commandments. Besides the Ten Commandments, what laws are still in effect after Christ's crucifixion? Um, what about all the food laws, like... Um, no pork or uh, seafood. Well, you have to. No, you want to. You want to read um, Leviticus chapter eleven. He did has the food laws have never been changed. Do you know why? Because flesh bodies have never been changed. And God told us what we could eat and be healthy. And that's what you want to do. You can break it down basically by saying. Don't eat scavengers. Only eat animals that live from things uh, growing from the earth. Uh, example, a cow. Grass comes from the earth. Cow eats grass it, you're, you're, uh, and has a, has a um, split hoof and chews its could. So it fits all the qualifications. It's good for you, okay, as long as you do it in moderation. But, uh, but then... Many will confuse uh, in First Timothy chapter four verse three uh, that that uh, God said it was okay that all animals were good. He said all animals are good, but in verse three, what does it say? Don't let anyone judge you in marriage or in food. That is to say, those things that God created to be received. Do you understand that? that God created to be received. He did not create scavengers to be received for food. But they are still good animals. Why? Because they cleanse the earth. And so it is. The rituals, which like blood sacrifice is, is um, no longer. It was nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2 tells you what was nailed to the cross and that Christ became. Ex example, uh, how do you worship Passover anymore? Well, Second Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter five, verse seven and eight tells you Christ became our Passover, our high Sabbath, our high holy day. Uh, and in Matthew five, it would tell you Christ Himself saying, "I don't change one jot, one tittle of the law," and so it is. Sacrifices done away with. Beverly from North Carolina. Could you help me understand, let's see what you got, understand in Matthew 21, 28, 
where those two sons answered their father about going to work in the vineyard. Uh, we said the first also, but it sounds like Jesus said we were wrong. Well, it, it's the one that actually produced fruit. Which one produced fruit? One said he wasn't going, and then changed his mind and went, and he did the father's work. And the other one said, yeah, I'll go, but he never quite got around to it. He never went. He's a louse, okay? It's the person that ultimately does God's work, gets it done. you got to produce fruit or God's not happy. Uh, Clarence from Florida. My question, some that... Um, some that believe in the rapture say that the tribulation is not for Christians or the church, but for Israel. Is this true? Well, uh, um, you know what? First, you'd have to be wise enough to know the house of Judah and the house of Israel are two separate houses. And you would have to know that the house of Israel were the ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains, were later called Caucasians, that settled Europe, many later coming to Canada and America, and they are Christian, the House of Israel is. And so uh, you're kind of doing double talk, but you're showing lack of knowledge to not know the difference between the House of Judah and the House of Israel. That's extremely important. You cannot really understand God's Word without understanding that simple fact that they are two separate houses. And be waiting for your answer and watching. Well, you've got it. The tribulation, as you read Mark 10, is it's no step for a stepper. Because as it is written in Luke 21, they can't harm a hair on your head. The false Christ is coming playing Jesus. In other words, he can't go around beheading people or harming people. Uh, or, or he would be proved a fake real easy. But he's really working with love, prosperity, and peace. And your peace sneaks are already lined up and ready to accept him. They'll do anything under the name of peace. Just give me peace, okay? Doesn't matter their character, their, what they stand for uh, can go out the window as long as you'll just talk peace to them. Uh, Peace comes at a price because there's a true peace and there's a false uh, peace. Uh, Satan will bring peace, all right. That's how he comes in, prosperously and peaceably, peaceably. And many people will be deceived by that very action. How sad that is for people to not know the simplicity in which Christ taught in Mark 13 of exactly how it's going down. Uh, Luella from Kentucky. Um, I would like to know about the Bride of Christ. I have heard lots of things. Is the Bride of Christ a church building? So some go to. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't God look real funny married to a chunk of wood or brick? I don't think so. That's, there's, a building does not make a church. The people do. Okay. Is the bride the Christian people who believe and then say they, or and, and say they have, or are then saved? Is the bride the people who have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and also believe? Some just uh, go get wet. Well, that's true too. What about the people in nursing homes that can't go to church? This is what brought me to this question. It's whether they believe or not. If they believe and have faith, you don't have to go to a church building. I, I have, well, I won't go in. Well, I will. Now, one, of the, one of the best men I've ever met in my life and as a neighbor and doing business with, as far as I know, never joined a church, never went inside a church, but he lived a Christian life that was just all near perfect. And so the... It's, uh, and in many of the buildings, they never teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse anyway. You're not going to learn anything even going to a building. But it's the people. They're God's children. And how God does love His children. 
uh, he, you know something? He died for them. Emmanuel, God with us on that cross. That's how much he loves them. And if you want to really know who the bride is, read Matthew chapter 25. There was 10 people almost made it. I mean, they were right up to the 11th hour. Five of them were playing around, and they didn't have enough oil in their lamp, which means they didn't have enough truth from God's Word because they weren't studying chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And they were pulled off by the false Christ at the last minute, and naturally Christ said, get out of my sight. I don't know you. They didn't make it because the false Christ deceived them. The bride of Christ is those that know the difference between the fake and the true Christ. Robert from Illinois. My question, if I dislike or just hate someone, is this the same as judging, even though in my mind I am justified in disliking them? Um, that's spiritual discernment, Robert. A person, uh, a person doesn't, uh, if someone has, when you say that when, when you say that you are justified in disliking them, you have a reason. That spiritual discernment says stay away from them. As a matter of fact, it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6, even if it's a brother, that's one born of the womb of Israel or your family, if, if they finally just get to the point you can't get along with them, set them to one side. It tells you exactly, according to God's law, how to handle the situation. You don't have to treat them as an enemy, but braid them down right real good and don't have anything to do with them necessarily. Don't feed them especially or enable them. You can read it for yourself. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. Spiritual discernment is not judging. Don't, once you've been burned, don't be burned again, okay? <laughs> Getting burned again, first time you're burned, you can say, shame on you. But the second time you're burned by the same person, shame on me, okay? Richard from Ohio, is chicken a clean food to eat? Well, what did, when, when our people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, what did God send them to eat? Number one, he sent angels' food, according to the great book of Psalms, and that was manna, bread from heaven. But what else did he send? What did God send besides manna to the children in the wilderness? He sent quail. Quail is poultry. They're a clean animal. And, and um, uh, God sent them as food to sustain, along with angels' food, the children of Israel. Chicken, um, it's okay. Aaron, there, you know, what you feed people, uh, animals is what counts, too. Aaron from Arkansas. Will Satan and the Nephilim be able to read minds or raise the dead to try and fool God's people? Uh, can they recall sins for the past? No, no. It's erased. When God erases something, it is erased. But uh, the fallen angels nor Satan can read minds. Only God is, as it's written in the Greek, cardio nor. He knows your heart. Okay? He, you don't have to even say it. He knows what you're thinking even. That's why you don't ever, ever want to try to con God or put something over on him. You're kidding yourself. You're making a fool of yourself if you ever try to even. Why? Because he knows what you're thinking. And uh, so uh, Satan, he cannot read minds. Only God can give life. Satan can't raise anyone from the dead. However, he is subtle, a trickster, and can make things seem like what they're not. So that too, you have to be careful of the Hand is quicker than the eye. Your eye better be quicker than the hand. You better be wiser than the serpent, is what I'm saying. Susan from Missouri, Pastor Murray, will the two witnesses make themselves known by their teaching prior to the arrivals of the Antichrist? The Antichrist originally was given 42 months, Revelation 13. 
the <coughs> the uh, two witnesses were given 1,260 days. That's both of those are three and a half years. One solar because the two witnesses are children of light. 42 moons because Satan is of the darkness. Okay. But moons are not as long as days are. In other words, a 30-day month is longer than one moon. So that means being the deduction being that the two witnesses, even though the time has been shortened to five months, are still solar, and they will be here prior to the false Christ. It is their teachings and their ability that will cause you to recognize them. It's supernatural, basically. Uh, Greg from Oklahoma, talking about the behemoth in the book of Job, the Strong's reference 930 says that it is a hippo of the Ni or a Nile horse, uh, a water oxen, and said it's a dumb beast. Well, I think, you know, this is something, read the description in the book of Job in, in chapter 40 about the behemoth. It's got, a, uh, it's got a tail like a cedar tree. That I mean, that thing, it's got a tail 30 to 60 feet long. How long is a hippopotamus's uh, tail? It's like a little pig's tail, okay? It won't work, so you know that's wrong, and I'm out of time. It was a dinosaur, and it's described perfectly. Out of being out of time, I want to say I love you because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it. It's His letter to you personally to help you be a better person. You make His day when you do that. When you make His day, He's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. Stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them.
the sower. You know, um, that's kind of the obligation and the duties of God's children is to sow, to sow seeds. And the agriculture terminology is fantastic because basically you get a deeper understanding. You know, it's amazing to me. You know, if you truly are a farmer, what kind of seed do you sow? The very best you have. A lot of times you'll have a lot better luck fishing or sowing or planting if you plant those very chosen seeds. They'll grow a lot better. I will never forget what wrote me in, what brought me into the Word. And it was when a man at a very time that there was trauma in my family walked by and says, isn't it wonderful to know where we, America, is mentioned in the Bible? And I said, oh, it is. And he walked 